Crash Bandicoot, a franchise that has been around for some time now. Back in the late 90s, this mofo was quite popular. That being due to the fact that he was the PlayStation mascot. Oh, and of course also due to the fact that the Crash Bandicoot games on the PlayStation 1 was pretty awesome. Now Crash Bandicoot Warp was one of my first games I have ever played. And due to that fact, of course, the franchise is very near and dear to my heart. So when my PlayStation 1 sadly passed away due to an untimely heart attack, the PlayStation 2 arrived at just the right time. Gone was Crash Bandicoot Warped and in came a whole bunch of new Crash Bandicoot games. And my goodness, it was exciting. Because as we all know that the Crash Bandicoot franchise was at its peak during the PlayStation 2 era. It definitely didn't suck at all and didn't have very mediocre games during that time. It, that wasn't at all the fact. Okay, sarcasm aside, once Naughty Dog sold the franchise, uh, the franchise kind of fell off. And that just so happened to be at the start of the PlayStation 2 era. Unfortunately, this franchise wouldn't reach the heights of the original games until many years later in 2017 when they remade well the original games but you see people there might be one diamond in the rough that stood above all the others in that era I am talking about Crash to Insanity. I am willing to say that during that era, this was probably most people's favorite Crash Bandicoot game. And it most certainly was mine. But of course today, I am doing the thing where I dive back into an old game and play through it to see if it is worth playing in 2024. However, this one is special because in order to do a fair review of this game, I have to take off the nostalgia glasses. So join me as I dive back into Crash Bandicoot to Insanity to see if this bad boy is worth playing in 2024. This game's story is absolutely bonkers. It is crazy. Some might say it is a... Uh, insanity okay dumb jokes aside this game story is bonkers it has a lot of issues so let's start at a point the first big issue i have with this game story is the fact that it moves way too fast you go from one part of the story to another to the other I guess what I'm trying to say here is that this story doesn't flow naturally. It feels very stitched together. This is very evident with a lot of the characters appearing from nowhere. There are so many times where characters just conveniently appear at a spot to progress the story. Coco appearing in Neocortex's lab or Entropy and Embryo appearing on a... Uh, a piece of ice in the middle of nowhere is just two examples. Then there is the side plot of the treasure that is just conveniently thrown into the story to, you know, be convenient. Seriously, this plot point has just been thrown into the story to conveniently link some boss fights because somehow one of the main villains telling Neo and Crash that there is a treasure, all the other enemies in the game somehow also know about this treasure because, uh, I don't know, it has never been explained. It's absolutely stupid and it makes no sense and it just doesn't fit in the story. Now, Neo Cortex has been swapped out as the main villain and is now teaming up with Crash himself, which means that there has to be a new villain. And in this case, it is two new villains. Two birds. Yes, this game, Bird Up. Bird Up! <laughs> Yeah, these two are absolutely terrible villains. They are extremely bland and overall just very forgettable. Overall, Crash to Insanity story is insanity. It is a bunch of garbage loosely put together to form an incoherent mess that is an excuse for a story. It's not memorable and not really fun. It's just there. <laughs> Visually, this game is not that bad. Uh, keeping in mind that this is a PlayStation 2 game, I think it looks pretty well for that era. 
Also, cartoony graphics generally hold up much better than realistic graphics, especially from that time. The characters also look faithful to the original, which might sound like a weird thing to, you know, talk about or criticize, but um, yeah, if you know the Crash Bandicoot games on the PlayStation 2, you would know that uh, they are two games that decided to chuck this element in the bin. So I will praise this game for at least being faithful to the original character's designs. The environments look very cool as well, especially the 10th dimension, and Madame Amberley's Academy of Evil has some of the coolest environments in this game. Now the sound design sounds pretty much what you would expect for a Crash Bandicoot game. However, when it comes to the soundtrack of this game, that is where it shines. The soundtrack of this game was made by an acapella group. And you know what I think about acapella? I don't care. Seriously, acapella is just a bunch of boom 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 boom. Oh wow. And then you mash it all together and you get this. Oh wow. The point I'm trying to make here is that I think Occupella is pretty stupid. However, this game's soundtrack made me eat my words because this game's music absolutely slaps. I genuinely think that the soundtrack in this game is probably the most memorable soundtrack of all the Crash Bandicoot games. The way the music mixes with the environments and sets the scene is it's just uh, mwah, perfect. So yeah, I think the visuals and the sound of this game is pretty decent, but more importantly, the soundtrack is very good and very memorable. <laughs> Boy, now we are getting into it. The level design of this game is a mixed bag. Now let's start with probably the more unique element of this game's levels. This game has a sort of open world game design, more or less an open area design. There are quite a lot of areas in this game that has more open space to explore and in these areas you can find uh, gems and mostly gems and of course a little bit of wampa fruits and some extra lives but uh, gems, mostly gems. Now these gems are practically useless unless you want to 100% the game. If you just want to get through the game, well, exploring these open areas are pointless. There is no reason to do so unless maybe you want the extra lives, but most of the time it's not even worth going after them. All that said, I still think it's a unique idea, and getting some of these gems are pretty fun. All of them pretty much has a puzzle you have to solve, and some of them are brain dead while others are pretty fun. However, I think the fundamental problem with these areas is the fact that the game didn't find a proper way to make you want to explore them. Meaning that for a lot of players, this is just blank open space you have to get through. Now when it comes to the actual levels, well this is where the bag gets mixed. Now I will talk about this a little bit more in the gameplay section, but this game doesn't have new abilities you unlock throughout it. Why is this important? Well, unlike some of the earlier Crash games, you won't be unlocking a double jump, you won't be unlocking a new bazooka, and therefore most of the levels aren't gonna be designed to incorporate this new ability of yours. You have everything Thing you need from the get-go. So in some cases the levels can feel very boring and very similar to previous levels. What I'm trying to say here is that it reaches a point where the game just kind of feels stale. When a game constantly gives you new abilities that you unlock throughout it and then designing the levels around those abilities it gives the game a freshness element that this game completely lacks. And this is the case for most of the levels in the this game. The platforming is 
just kind of bland and not really well designed to actually be engaging enough and it sucks because there are some absolutely fantastic levels that this game has and the reason why some of these levels stand out is because well the platforming is actually good basically being a workaround for the lack of new abilities you see in crash twin sanity you don't get new abilities but some of these levels give you much better and much more tighter platforming making it more challenging and therefore more engaging to prove my point let's compare a few levels the iceberg level you need to traverse to get to cortex's lab is a perfect example of a very bland level most of the platforms in this level are very basic they are wide platforms and really easy to jump on the only real challenge in this level is the relentless bats and the kamikaze penguins oh yeah and the slow moving platforms that will test your patience but despite that the level is very simple and so easy to get through now compare that to the level in engine ship you have slippery surfaces tnt and nitro crates everywhere platforms with much smaller surfaces and some that can spring you up into the air you also have enemies and obstacles that sway left and right up and down moving platforms and enemies that themselves create unique obstacles this level creates much more of a challenge and therefore creates a much more memorable level and by making the level more challenging it makes up for a lack of abilities the thing is if every level was like engine ship and the last level in the game this game would have been way better than it is the problem is that these levels are far and few between most of them are just very basic and really easy to get through then of course there are the levels where the game changes up its mechanics you have the levels where crash and cortex start beating each other up to the point where they form a ball and you then have to roll them around through a level and it really sucks i think the reason these levels suck so much is because all of the platforming elements are taken away from it you are essentially just rolling a ball throughout a level and well the ball doesn't even control that good anyway so it's just kind of boring it's not that good and a lot of these factors count for a lot of the other levels like this the levels where you use cortex as a skateboard has the same issues and therefore again is way less memorable i also want to highlight the level where you throw neo cortex into a pipe and basically roll him around throughout the level in this level you have all the platforming of crash bandicoot the problem is that it feels like a tedious escort mission you are essentially slowed down by neo cortex you have to clear the way for him in order to progress the level and it just to me is very very tedious and i would have much rather have two more levels like engine's ship then a level like this one look i'm not saying these levels were bad ideas changing a game's levels up can be a good thing and is something i like in a lot of other games the problem is that the execution in this game is a little bit poor now this game's levels also has a whole bunch of repetition look at all that repetition i get it they ran out of time and they had to use ideas and assets they already had and you know just kind of mixed it up but still this is an overall negative to the game's level design and well some of these levels where the game just repeats itself is much worse in the later stages a perfect example would be the stealth levels where on insanity island there is way more platforming in these stealth levels than there are later on at the academy of evil where you basically just hide behind something instead of you know actually doing platforming so yeah it's just a prime example of how this negatively affects the game's levels overall overall the levels in this game are very underwhelming yes this game has two or three great levels in it but unfortunately those great levels are just not enough to make the levels overall be fantastic leaving the levels of this game to be underwhelming
Now this game has a lot of gameplay elements of the other Crash Bandicoot games. Like I already mentioned, you do not unlock new abilities in this game. All of the abilities you have are already available to you from the get-go. Now some might point out that Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time, also gives you all of your abilities from the get-go. And well, yeah, that is true. The big difference is that that game gives you new abilities in terms of the masks you unlock, and also the levels are much better designed, and way better in almost every way than this game's levels, making the gameplay in that game feel way better than it is in this one. So what exactly can I highlight in the gameplay? Well, let's start by the enemy variety, because surprisingly, this game has a very good variety of enemies, and a lot of them have unique moves, and, and well, I really like that. Sure, this factor isn't going to make the platforming any better, but it does help make the combat in this game feel pretty good. Yes, even though Crash Bandicoot only has a spin and slide attack, fighting a lot of these enemies that all feel unique makes it way more interesting than, you know, just giving one or two enemies to fight. The same, unfortunately, could not be said about the boss fights, who are almost all pretty boring. Most of the boss fights in this game are so easy and simplistic to defeat, to the point where I wonder why the hell they are even in the game. The engine boss fight especially is one that absolutely could get cut out of the game and nobody would miss it. It is so absolutely boring and is very unfortunate given that it comes after one of the best levels in this game. However, there are again one or two boss fights that are actually good. Of course, there is the Dingo Dial boss fight, which is not only the best fight in this game, but one of the best fights over all the Crash Bandicoot games put together. And of course, the Madam Emily fight is also pretty good. Speaking of the Madam Emily boss fight, you fight that boss as Neo Cortex. Yes, this game let you play as Neo Cortex and Nina Cortex. Now, Neo Cortex is probably the most unique to play as. He has a gun that shoots enemies, uh, a very simplistic jump, he is very slow, and um, he does this when his ammo is finished. Why are you running? Now, despite all of that and the fact that he feels pretty unique to play as, I would still just much rather play as Crash Bandicoot, because he's not really that fun to play as in any way. Crash Bandicoot, much better to play as. And well, the same can be said for Nina Cortex, even though that's for different reasons. Nina is way too similar to Crash to really justify giving a new character to play as, if you get what I'm saying. She can or double jump and she has a fist punch attack but despite that she pretty much feels exactly the same as Crash. Hell, she even has a spinning attack just like Crash. She also has this grapple hook system which uh, absolutely doesn't work. This is especially very annoying in the final boss battle where you have to grapple to the top of two platforms to destroy these uh, light bulb things and my goodness this grapple system is is absolutely broken. The other gameplay style that also exists in this game is when Crash and Neo Cortex basically uh, they join up via crystal uh, where basically the movesets are again exactly the same as normal Crash where you also have a spin attack you don't really have a belly flop instead you smash stuff with Neo Cortex's head which is pretty funny and you also have a single jump you cannot double jump but again it just feels too similar to the base Crash gameplay mechanics and therefore you know it just feels like the game is trying to gaslight you into to feeling that you have this unique and different gameplay style when in reality it is not really that different at all. Okay, let's get into the bugs because this game is unfinished. Yeah, the developers ran out of time making this game and therefore it is not polished. This game also came out during an era where you couldn't just update your game after you released it. If you release a broken mess, well, it would stay a broken mess. There are a lot of terrible hitboxes, a lot of bugs that would happen during cutscenes, and um, there's this. I don't know what this is, 
but it's probably the coolest bug in the game, so you know, I would at least give this one a thumbs up. But yeah, this game is terribly broken and well, these bugs can sometimes be very annoying. Overall, I do think that this game could have more to offer, but unfortunately the gameplay of this game is just okay. It doesn't offer anything new or anything fantastical, it's just okay. <laughs> From a nostalgic point of view, this game brought back some great memories of me playing it as a child. However, in terms of this game being a good platformer, it unfortunately is not. Yes, this is almost certainly the Crash Bandicoot game that got away. I definitely think that if the developers had way more time with it, maybe they could have actually made a pretty good game. And yes, of course, this game is way better than all of the other Crash Bandicoot games on the PlayStation 2, so there is that at least. Now when it comes to the question is Crash Bandicoot 2 Insanity worth playing in the year 2024, the answer to that is yes, but purely for nostalgic purposes. If you are looking for a good platformer from that era, the answer is no. There are definitely way better platforming options from that era, and well there's also the factor that this game is pretty buggy and pretty unfinished and also very short because you know it's unfinished so overall i would say that twin sanity is not worth playing in the year 2024 so yeah that's all i have for this video if you've made it this far thank you very much for watching bye bye